we really need to suspend our seating so we can say come on down to people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First Corinthians six. First Corinthians six. All right. So what we are doing is we're following up on uh, Frank Finney's uh, lesson on practical faithfulness. So some of this is going to be a little bit of a rehash because I'm trying to build upon what he had done. Uh, with it, which was actually really, really good. It's kind of hard to, and I, I'm not, I'm not trying to top it or anything like that. I just simply I wanted to add on uh, to it because this was the, um, the fourth week as far as how do you develop it practically. And so he gave the foundation for it, and then we're going to address that a little bit more fully uh, towards the end of our, um, towards the end of our outline here. But First Corinthians six, all right, beginning at. Verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Okay, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Right, so, in seeking to develop faithfulness practically, you ask, okay, well, how do you do that? We've been challenged pretty much for the most part up to this point that Hi, good morning. good morning. We need to be faithful. Okay, that stands pretty clear. Thank you. That we need to be faithful. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, uh, we're in, you're welcome. You're welcome. We're in uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Um, so we see it's, it's kind of like that. It's something that's necessary, it's needful, and then we're convicted by it. And then the thing that I normally ask myself, and then we're convicted by it, and then the thing that I normally ask myself is, okay, so how do I do that? How do I accomplish that? How does that come about? And then, um, then I want to be faithful. Or if I'm challenged to be faithful, I'm commanded to be faithful, and I'm not, and I find myself in a position where I'm failing in that area, how do I do that then? What do I do? How do I actually become faithful? Well, this is a little bit building on some of his... Uh, the first two of the outline is going to be pretty much kind of a rewording, but it's similar. Um, we first we got to acknowledge our new master and here's the thing about that the thing is i don't have control of my body anymore i don't have control of my desires i don't have well i make purposeful choices as far as what i want to desire and um, we'll see that later on but the fact is uh, i am no longer the boss of me anymore and so i need to yield myself to who is my new master so first corinthians Chapter 6, verse 19, indicates to us very clearly in chapter 20 uh, as to who I belong to, and that is I belong to God. Okay, now, in context, he's addressing the Corinthian church about the fact that they have somebody that is involved in a really wicked sin in having um, committing uh, fornication with his, uh, I guess it would be his stepmom, his father's wife. Okay, so that doesn't indicate that it's his mother, but rather that it would be his stepmother. And then he also immediately previously to he he's addressing the fact that uh, fornication is something that's really wicked. It's a sin against your own body. He says in verse 18 that we're supposed to flee fornication. Um, and then every sin that man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication is sinning against his own body. So that's even a greater, um, not that it's a more wicked sin than any other, but rather than it's, it's something that affects you physically, 
uh, in greater measure than most other sin would, because uh, you're actually you're you're, de you're you're destroying your body, and the thing is, your body's not your own to do with as you please anymore. You're actually God's now. So acknowledging the fact that I am God's uh, makes me what? If I'm not the owner of something, that makes me steward. 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 Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So go. If you go back to good morning. Um, go back a few chapters to chapter four. Chapter four. Um, we see here at the beginning of verse one. It says, uh, it "said let a let a man so account of us as a." as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Uh, and moreover, it is required of the stewards that a man be found faithful. Okay, so context here is, is he's addressing the argument that some people are putting forth in the Corinthian church that, okay, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And then they're looking to exalt men, and then he's just putting forth the argument saying that, look, we're just servants. We're servants of God like anybody else. So we're stewards. And by the way, a steward is someone that is not an owner of something, but he's allotted something. In other words, he doesn't own it. He's given charge of it, and that steward is, if he's going to be pleasing to God, somebody that is to be faithful. Okay, so if my body is no longer my own, that makes me a steward of it, and God's the master. And if I'm going to be pleasing to God, that means I'm going to seek to be faithful in my stewardship. So what are some things that uh, are stewardships? Okay, the in our outline here it says we, we recognize our new responsibilities and that is because okay we have a new master so it's my stewardships and so to my master go to 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 4 and 1 Peter 4 For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should not, that he should no longer, uh, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Now here's why. This is for um, the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Okay, so in other words, because we're bought with a price, and because the time pass of our life, whether you were born again at the age of four, or whether you were born again at the age of 40, the fact is, what time you had spent in the flesh as an unsaved person is wasted life. And so what you have before you now is opportunity to be able to live for God and accrue reward for Him and to be able to have something to be able to, when you stand before Him at the judgment seat, uh, be able to cast down and that wood pass <coughs> that fire. Uh, preferably it would be gold, silver, precious stone and not wood, hay, stubble that would burn up. And so... I have new responsibilities to my master, and then go to Ephesians 4, and that is also to, uh, this is following a little bit of uh, Brother Finney's outline, and to our family. Now I'm going to be skipping a bit through here, just because it's pretty much chapters 4, 5, and 6. And you can see this also paralleled in Colossians and as well as in Philippians. Um, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, okay, with all loneliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, and then endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And he goes on to explain that we're one body. And we see this clearly also, which we're going to look at later in 1 Corinthians 12, that we are of the body of Christ and that we're members in particular, so we've been gifted by God and that's going to be an area of responsibility that we have uh, to be able to keep, to try to seek to be faithful in. But 
here he's commanding us, he's begging us really that we should walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Okay, so note we have Christ's name upon us. And we, okay, go down to verse 11. Uh, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then here's going to be the scope of that uh, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge. Of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? So in other words, that maturing process and maturity process is going to be basically until when we see Christ, till either when Christ returns or till we in our flesh, our time passes. And then we're, we're going to go be, we're, our spirit's going to go be with him. And then we're waiting for our body to be renewed. Um, but he's it's interesting here. I know I keep harping, it seems like a broken record, but this is this is just fact. We need to let this sink in. Is that he's given? Now he mentions that he's given some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, and some uh, apostles and some prophets. And then verse twelve for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the finding of the body of Christ. So in other words, the idea is is that. Not everybody's called, and we see that in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 as well, because we're members in particular, and that some are, some, some are going to be the eyes, some are going to be the feet, some are going to be the hand. Um, and so we're all, you know, given different responsibilities and different gifts, and different measure and area of, um, of things to be able to do by the Lord. And the Holy Spirit's the one that's doing that. But it's all for the same purpose, for the same cause. And it says here it's for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So in other words, it's not exclusive, the work of the ministry is not exclusive to those that are just the pastor teachers that he's only given some, but rather it's everybody included in its own. In other words, everybody that is a member, everybody that's a body part, everybody that would be edified by those that would be a pastor teacher or a evangelist, are going to be involved, or are expected to be involved in the work of the ministry, and it's for the edifying of the body of Christ. So in other words, it's, that's how the, the body of Christ is built up. It's all of us together, working together uh, as, a, as, a, as a unit. And so we have responsibilities then that we need to recognize, that we need to acknowledge. And now we see how that is practically carried out here in the commands that we see in chapters 4, 5, and even going into 6 in Ephesians. Now, this is limited to just Ephesians, but um, let's see, go down to verse 17. Okay, this I say, therefore, testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. Um, and ver you skip down to verse 20, it says, because you have not so learned Christ. So in other words, we're called to think different, and we're called to live different, we're called to act different, and it's because we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's because we have His Spirit, we have a new direction, a new command, a new purpose, and it's because of Him. And uh, verse 22, it says, that you put off uh, concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And then be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And now he gets very practical. Uh, verse, verses 25 going all the way through basically chapter 6, verse uh, what do I have here? Chapter 6, verse 20. You're going to have uh, just very specific commands. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor. Uh, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down. Uh, upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Okay, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things, with, uh, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Okay, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We're not to see, we're not to verse, uh, well, thirty. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, which whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Verse thirty-one. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. 
So this is how I am to interact with people from now on until basically Christ returns because this is my new directive, my new command. This is the master that I serve now uh, under whose uh, direction I'm supposed to yield myself to, basically. Um, I, you know, if I am going to be somebody that's going to be well-pleasing, I'm going to be somebody that's going to stand before Christ as having, uh, or being able to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, I'm going to be seeking to, you know, to, to have these things uh, in, in my life. So, uh, we've seen, okay, we acknowledge and reckon your new master. We're supposed to recognize our new responsibility. So then, okay, you ask, okay, how do we get to do that then? Okay, we were told to do this. How do we how do we do that then? All right. So Galatians five, he he actually says it here in verse uh, in chapter four that uh, ye be renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye put off the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Uh, Brother Finney addressed in Romans twelve last week that. Um, we're supposed to not only surrender ourselves to the Lord, but uh, we're supposed to allow our minds to be renewed. Uh, and that's a daily renewal. The only, I cannot prove the will of God in my life. In other words, the proving of the will of God is the actual demonstration or the carrying out of the will of God in my life. That's what God wants to see done and accomplish. But that only happens as I renew my mind, as I'm renewing my mind. Uh, Galatians 5, Galatians 5. Okay, 516, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, I'm commanded, walk in the spirit. How do I do that? It starts by making a purposeful choice. Uh, Ephesians 518, be not drunk with wine and wearing his excess, and, but be filled with spirit. Uh, go to Daniel, and then we're going to go to Ezra real quick. Daniel 1.8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the, of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Okay, the context here is that Daniel has been taken into captivity. He has been gathered and chosen by, in particular, the, the prince or the governor of the eunuchs, the individual that's responsible for the eunuchs that are going to be serving in the court of, of the king. And so he was found to be goodly or comely along with a number of other Hebrews. And he, seeking to be faithful to God, even though he's going to be taken away from Israel, and he's going to be in captivity, um, decided and purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself. In other words, he said, I am going to do right by God, even though I don't have anybody that's going to be, you know, kind of there to prop me up or to help me out or any of those things. He, what he did was he said, okay, God, you're good. He recognized God's goodness, God's faithfulness in his life, uh, despite the circumstances being as they were. And he said, I'm going to do right by God. So it takes a purposeful decision in your heart to say, I am going to do right. Uh, go to Ezra 7, and here's how this is accomplished as well. Seven ten it says for Ezra, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. The context here is that basically 
Israel is already in captivity. He happens to be one of the individuals that is actually going out to uh, preach to Israel concerning the law. Now they found the book of the law and they rehearsed it. This is around the same time as Nehemiah, whenever Nehemiah was building up the walls. And there was a time where they found the book of the law. They were basically rehearsing it in the ears of the folks. And he actually was one of the individuals that was responsible for, because by this time, they had already been captivity long enough to where they didn't really have a good understanding of, of Hebrew. And so he was still knowledgeable enough with Hebrew to be able to go ahead and give the sense thereof of the actual words of the text of, of, the, of, of the scripture. But he himself, this is something that's pretty unique. It says of him that uh, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. Okay, so in other words, he said, God, my life's a blank check. You fill in the amount. Uh, I am going to do what you say. Okay, there's no reservations, there's no restrictions in my life to what you want. Okay, what the Word of God says, I'm going to seek to do it, regardless of what it's going to cost me. Okay, that, that would be the mindset or the attitude. So we have to first approach, okay, with regard to how to be faithful, is the fact that I need to recognize, listen, I am bought by God. You know, he has rights to every single aspect of my life. I have no claim to it whatsoever. But I am a steward. So in other words, he's given me control over everything in my life, my body, uh, what I watch, what I listen to, uh, who I communicate with, what I do, uh, you know, where I work, every single little thing that you would normally take, I guess, we don't really, <laughs> not, not very many of us take time to really think about, okay, well, what do I do? And so the thing is, I need to first acknowledge God's ownership of my life, and then two, I need to purpose, I need to actually make a determination in my heart that says, okay, God, what you say, what you do, the priorities that you want for me, is what I'm going to govern my life or structure my life around and have that be the mitigating factor, the controlling factor in my life. Okay, uh, Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For your dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And then he's going to go through and list a number of commands that pretty much kind of echoes uh, Ephesians 4 through 6, um, and, and to some degree uh, Philippians uh, 3 and 4. But we are, beyond purposing, I need to set my affections. I need to, the uh, Bible tells us in Proverbs that um, we're to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The things that I let influence my heart, um, we're again commanded in First John that we're not to love the world, any of the things that are in the world. For the things that are in the world, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life are not of the Father, you know, but they're of the world. And that's going to pass away, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. So in other words, God's will is the only thing that has any really lasting value to it. Okay? Yes, we live in a temporal world where we have responsibilities that we have to keep, you know. We have bills to pay, we got to work. Uh, we have our health to maintain. Uh, and even though our bodies are temporal, uh, that is as much a stewardship because the better I am, I'm not, I, I'm not guaranteed. There are, there are a few promises in Scripture with regard to long life. Okay, one being... Uh, honor your mother and dad. Yes, honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment of promise. Uh, that it may be well with thee and that that might be live long upon the earth. Uh, then you have others with regard to just knowing God's will and doing it, then your life will be extended beyond what it would be. 
but I'm not guaranteed uh, a long life. In other words, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm 42. <laughs> I'm not guaranteed that I'll make 50, or even 43 for that matter. Uh, I'm, I'm praying towards that, and I'm actually praying that I'll be able to, you know, live past 90 and be able to still be useful in God's service uh, past that age as well. But I'm not, I'm, again, that, that's, that's a personal desire, but I'm not guaranteed that. Uh, you know, James, our life is but a vapor. Even if I were to live that long, the fact is my time is very short here, and it's uh, something that I need to be very conscientious about. Uh, as Moses said, that we're, you know, teach me the number of my days. Uh, and so, setting my affections on things above, that's a purposeful choice, that's a direct command, that's an appeal to my will. And so the thing is, if I don't set my affections on things above, uh, I'm going to be deviating, or I'm not going to have a focus or a mindset that is going to be God-conscious or God-focused. Um, we've already looked at the renewing of my mind. That's accomplished by um, basically me getting into the Word of God. It's crucial that I allow the Word of God to impact me. Um, if you don't have a determined set of time uh, within your day to be able just to take to read, um, you want to you want to read with a purpose that says, "God, I want to know you. I want to know you better." Now He may rebuke you during that reading portion, or he, he may strengthen you. As far as you may come across something that you don't really have an issue with, but it's it, it reinforces, um, like in Ecclesiastes where. He, talks about that. Uh, go to Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. In 12 verse 11, it says, The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given uh, from one shepherd. Okay, so a goad, that's a prodding stick. <laughs> that's not very pleasant to feel, you know. You use that to, to move, you know, well, it would have been in their case uh, oxen, but you would have, you know, cattle or something like that. So you, they make, the, they feel the pain, so they, okay, they know, hey, I need to move forward. I need to move, I need to move on in the direction, wherever. Okay, it's as a goad, but it also says it's as um, nails. Uh, there is nails fastened by the master's assembly. So they're used to not only, um, you know, <clears throat> maybe what would seem uh, painful at the moment, uh, but also to go ahead and secure some things or send some things down that uh, maybe I wasn't as strong in or I, need, I needed reinforced. And then go to, back to Colossians, Colossians 2, 6. Okay, Colossians 2 6. As ye have therefore received Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him. Okay, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And Hebrews eleven six is without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, if I'm going to set my affections, if I'm going to be allowing the renewing of my mind. Okay, that also should lead into uh, life by faith. The thing is, the Christian life is, is by faith. It's the same way that I get saved. You get saved by faith, and the only way to be able to move forward in it is to live by faith. So this, this is a crucial element. Um, how do I know, you know, that, you know, what God says is real concerning what we have coming for, you know, what we have awaiting us down the road. Well, okay, just eternity, future. That there is going to be a beam of seat. You know, where we're going to stand before him and then he's going to, our works are going to be burnt up as wood, hay, stubble, or they're going to survive the fire as gold, silver, precious stone. How do we know that? Yeah. Do we have any other kind of proof or evidence on that? What else? Holy Spirit living within us, uh, change lives. Uh, 
Um, go to Second Peter chapter three. There's actually yeah, there is. Those are all really good, actually. Um, start at verse 3. We're going to read down to verse 9. Second uh, Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 3. Okay, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they are as they were from the beginning of the creation. No, for this they are willingly, or for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of the uh, by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, uh, whereby the world that um, that then was being overflowed with water perished, uh, but the heavens and earth, which are now. By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Okay, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all uh, shall come to repentance. Those are good, because the fact is... Holy Spirit's the one that's going to confirm what you would read, and He's the one that's going to reinforce. He's going to be the one. He's. We're told in, in John 14, 15, 16, you know, He's going to lead us into all truth. He's going to bring all things into remembrance. Uh, he's there to convict or convince the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Right. So he, He's our grand instructor. Uh, he's the one confirming what we would read in, in God's Word. We can't really argue the evidence of changed lives in people. Um, honestly, it's kind of it's kind of hard to argue. I mean, it's like okay, you got somebody that was, you know, total hellion rebel against anything godly. All of a sudden, it's like he's committed his life to God, and then you see God supernaturally working on his behalf. I can't argue that. Um, now, granted, you could sit there. You would want to if you if you're gonna be a scoffer like these that are willingly ignorant, then they would say, okay, well, that's all subjective. How do I know? What do I have as objective proof? Well, here's one thing that he mentions here beyond those. You got the destruction of this world by the flood. Okay. Um, beyond all those, beyond all those, I'm not saying, okay, you don't have, I mean, this is in addition to all that. Okay, the fact is, how do I know that God's going to return, or that Christ is going to return? How do I know he's going to set up his kingdom? How do I know that we have done the future is because what he had already given us in over six to 8,000 years worth of human history concerning his acts towards men, how he's dealt with them, and in particular that when the earth was filled with violence and every heart, uh, every imagination of, thought of man's heart was evil only continually, he destroyed the world. Okay, Now only eight people were spared at that point uh, and that was they found grace in, the, in, in God's eyes because they, they decided to believe him. Now mind you, there could have been more, but there was that, there were that many people that were rebellious and unbelieving, and the fact is, even now God wants to spare. And He had yes. Um, does that imply that Noah and like just the eight and his family were the only ones that were saved at that time, like salvation-wise, or they're just the only ones that survived the flood? Well, He wouldn't have destroyed them if they hadn't, if they would have been believing. So there's literally only eight. Christian, so to speak, on um, the world at that time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As far as that, we're still living here. Could they have gotten saved when the floods were coming? Well, at that point, judgment would have already started. It's whenever, because that didn't start until the Lord told them, come in the ark and seal it. Right. So, up to that point, they had every opportunity afforded them. They had over 120 years, 120 years and seven days of. Noah building the ark with his kids. Well, I'm assuming he did with his kids. It just says that Noah built it, but I mean, I'm just saying I'm assuming his kids would have been involved with that. Um, and then beyond his, beyond just the actual building, but his actual preaching, that he he, uh, he was a preacher of righteousness. You know, so yeah. And you would want to argue. Well, they didn't know what rain was. I mean, they didn't have rain. Uh, they didn't have. 
whatever. But the fact is, it still came, and it was as if God, you know, God was right on the money with it. In other words, he, uh, he followed through on what he said he was going to do. He's done it before. He'll do it again. And so we have the destruction of that flood, of which we still obviously see the remnants of, uh, that can't be argued. You know, well, people won't argue, but it's it foolish. Yeah, it can't, it can't be. It can't be rationally argued. Yes? Well, just like um, Genesis 6, verse, uh, verse 9, Noah was a just man. Um, just even the same thing comparing Lot. I mean, in, in Sodom, Lot, even though he lived in Sodom, he had that little bit of righteousness and belief and faith in him. So Noah, when, um, as you said uh, before, that they didn't know what rain was, but God somehow communicated to Noah that there's going to be a rain. And because he was just, he believed God. Again, he had the faith. So he's like, okay, I don't know what, what this is, but I believe you, and this is what I'm going to do. Amen. Amen. Yes. And that's to say this. What we're told here with regard to our uh, responsibilities that we have, God's the owner of my body. I'm, I'm, I'm literally just a steward. I don't even own my own body. Okay? It's not my mind to think what I want to think with it. It's not my ears to uh, <clears throat> listen to whatever I want to listen, you know, and allow those influences or watch whatever I want to watch. You know, I have to guard those things or guard against what would influence my heart to want to have an affection that's other than what is above. Um, I allow my mind to be renewed, uh, seek to actively be in the Word of God, communicating with God in prayer, uh, and influencing, purposefully designing or orchestrating or um, organizing my life, structuring my life, so that the influences that keep me on a, uh, eternal focus, though I'm living here in a temporal world, uh, would be what is strengthening me, what is fueling me, what is motivating me. Um, and that is purposeful choices. Um, that is, I mean, that's a lot of that's just basic discipline um, on, a, on a daily basis. Okay. Now, just because I'm right right now doesn't mean that I'm going to be right tomorrow or 10 years from now. But if I actively work towards being right today and being right tomorrow, being right the next day, uh, as I'm <coughs> pointed, if I'm, I might keep my feet, my, feet, uh, my feet pointed in the right direction, walking step by step in faith, then, you know, you're, <laughs> you're going to end up in the right spot. You're going to end up in the right place where you should be and not deviated somewhere off path. Uh, so practical faithfulness. We need to be faithful. Um, because that's what's required in the stewards. That's the only way to be able to go ahead and please God. And the responsibilities that we've been given uh, demand it. And how do we do that is I need to purposefully choose one to, to do right. Uh, that's by renewing of my mind, by setting my affections, and by living by faith. Uh, next week we're going to look at obstacles to faithfulness. In other words, how is my faithfulness going to be attacked, and what can I do to keep guarded against those things that would, uh, to, um, to uh, basically that would deviate me from from a path of faithfulness to God. If well, one, two, there's only two. Well, okay, four of us. I'm sorry. <laughs> Most everybody here has been married or, or is married. Um, you wouldn't appreciate it if your spouse would have wandering eyes or have an affection towards somebody other than yourself. Uh, and again, you wouldn't appreciate that if you have children, that if they looked towards somebody else uh, for their influence in life and have uh, affection towards somebody other than you, other than you as, your, as, as your parent. And likewise, uh, God's given 
great sacrifice for our soul. Um, and he's given everything necessary for us to be able to have not only just, you know, eternal life, but even here, new life, uh, that is of great value. And so the thing is, it's, it's detrimental to us uh, in more ways than just what would be immediately uh, imaginable as far as if we allow our affections to be turned or if we are careless about where our affections are sent. Uh, okay, so next week we're going to be looking at um, the obstacles and then how to, how to avoid them, how to guard against them. All right, so we're dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. Yo.